Um, yeah, this, that was really nice. I, I haven't read that article from Discover in a really long time. And when he said he was going to read from it, I thought, damn, what did I say back then? <laughs> I, I didn't know nearly as much as I do now. Um, people often ask me where I got the idea to, to write about this book. And, and um, it was a chef, a chef back in Cleveland that I wrote about for Gourmet Magazine. And he, um, he's one of these wonderful, perpetually curious people. And he had grown up on a farm. And then he had, so he already had, always had an appreciation for the land and for agriculture. And then one day I contacted him and said, what, any new ideas of interesting things for me to write about? What's going on? And he said, carbon farming, that's the really interesting thing. So I'd never heard of it, and he gave me a couple of names to look up, um, two of whom became you know, people that I spent a lot of time talking to. One was Ratan Lal, who's a scientist in Ohio, and one was um, Abe Collins, who's a farmer in Vermont. Um, so anyway, I spent a lot of time talking to them and to lots of other people. And what I want you to come away from after reading my book and after talking tonight is a sense of wonder about the amazing stuff that goes on underneath our feet, the amazing, really amazing life in the earth. Um, I had read not too long ago that there are 300 sextillion stars, in, or that's the, the most recent estimate, 300 sextillion stars in the sky. So that's a three followed by 23 zeros. But Scientists now figure that in a teaspoon of pretty healthy soil, there are six billion microorganisms. Six, it's just, in, it's incomprehensible. Six billion microorganisms um, doing work. So that means that under Boulder, there are you know, more microorganisms doing work than there are stars in the sky. And they're not just in the, you know, we always think that, that the good soil, the fertile soil, the stuff that matters is just the top couple of inches. Well, it's really not the case. These microorganisms has been, have been found as far down as tw uh, 20 miles. Um, when oil companies drill, they have to be careful of microorganisms getting into the oil and eating it. Um, so they're busy down there. They're busy down there. They're eating. They're reproducing. They're um, busy creating habitat. So when we talk about solid ground, you know, we always talk about we're standing on solid ground. Well, it's not really solid ground, you know, because it's kind of more, we should think of it as more like a coral reef. It's kind of that honeycombed with the habitat that these microorganisms are making. So it's filled with life, their life. It's filled with the, the pockets that they make in the soil. It's, um, it's, it's very different from solid ground. And everything that we want above ground depends on what they're doing down there. And I also want you to walk away with reasonable new hope. You know, I have, I, I've never doubted the, the climate warming science, although I really wanted to lots of times because it's so depressing. Um, but, um, you know, the thing is, is that those early climate science projections weren't taking soil into account. And there's even still some reluctance to take the possibility that soil presents into account. Um, and most of us don't take soil into account. You know, we think of planet Earth as this rock spinning through space that has this little fringe of, of, of uh, Earth over it. And even though, I mean, even though my parents were lunatic, avid gardeners who were always out there puttering around in the soil and my grandparents were farmers and my great grandfathers were farmers. I had no idea what was going on in the soil. You know, so when people would talk about life in the soil, I would think about earthworms or beetles. And those are like the leviathans. Those are like the great blue whales of the soil. It's these tiny, tiny creatures that we can't see that are really so important. And they've been there long before any of these other creatures evolved. They've been there long before plants, certainly long before humans. Um, and they're crucial to the way our, our, our whole planet functions. So soil, you probably have heard this someplace, but you know, people talk about carbon sinks. You know, the oceans are a carbon sink, and the atmosphere is a carbon sink. You know, soil is a huge carbon sink, but it used to be much huger. So the whole promise lies in trying to get it back to being the carbon sink that it used to be before we messed it up. And um, 
the more I, the more I um, think about and read about and talk to scientists about this, this Earth's microbiome, um, it's so much like all the recent discussion and discoveries about human microbiomes. You know, um, you know, we've thought for years, before, in, before really the last five or six years, I'm not sure how long this conversation has been going on, but you know, we used to worry a lot about germs and viruses and st all our grocery stores still have pumps, hand pumps out there to, you know, so we can kill all the germs on our hands. But really, we are a ship of microbes. We have, um, the latest estimate is 100 trillion microbes in our body, on our body, in our noses, in our navels, um, in our digestive system. Um, a, a, a thousand species of bacteria alone. So scientists have said that you know if you took all the microorganisms out of our body and filled a bucket with them, it, you know, it'd be a couple, two or three pounds. And not only are they not harmful to us, they're essential for us. You know, we wouldn't be able to function. Our energy and our metabolism and our brain function, all this stuff wouldn't function properly if we did not have this human microbiome. So the, the soil is the same way, only on a much grander scale. We, our planet, really needs this, this microbiome that's in the soil. So scientists have known it was there for a while, but it's only fairly recently, and fairly recently with the newer tools of science that they understand what, that, what all those microorganisms are doing in the soil and why they're important to us. So we all learned about photosynthesis back when we were young. And that's the, really the great biological marvel of our planet, you know, that, that plants are there and they have leaves and they're putting them up into the, into the air and they're like the first solar panels and they're um, using the sun's energy to, to take carbon dioxide and break it apart and make a carbon fuel from that. And they're just sort of tossing out the oxygen for us to enjoy, but they're after the carbon. So they're making a carbon fuel. And, and they're using that carbon fuel to grow and expand and make fruit and flower. Um, but they're also sharing 40% of that carbon fuel. They're, they're sending 40, up to 40% and, some, and in some cases more. 40% of that carbon fuel they're sending down to the roots so that they can share it with the microorganisms in the soil. So why would they do that? Why would they share this precious substance? And so I, in the book I call it like the first superfood. You know, share that precious fuel that they've worked so hard to make. Why would they sh leak it out through their roots to these microorganisms? Well, there's a partnership that goes on there in the soil. So the microorganisms have enzymes that liberate nutrients from rock, mineral nutrients from rock. So they, the microorganisms, the bacteria, the fungi, some of the other ones, um, they are able to get the minerals that plants need to grow from rock and from sand and from silt and from clay. And they bring that over to the plants. And there's this trade. I mean, it's not quite as simple as that, but it's basically that's what's going on. There's this trade between the soil microorganisms and the plants. The plants are giving up some of their carbon fuel. The soil microorganisms are giving up some of those, those mineral nutrients. And so, so that car, that's how the carbon gets down in the soil to begin with, and that's been going on ever since plants got onto land five, you know, uh, half a billion years ago. Um, so the, the microorganisms are taking that carbon and they're growing, but they're also using it, and this is, this is also critically important. So some of that carbon that the plants send down there resides in the bodies of these microorganisms. So that's where some of that soil carbon is. But they're also taking that carbon fuel and making a carbon glue. And they're, they're, they're making habitat for themselves. So they're taking that carbon glue and they're taking a piece of sand and a piece of silt and maybe a tiny little piece of leaf and gluing these things together so that they can protect themselves against other microorganisms that want to eat them because it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world down there. So they're always you know, trying to protect themselves. They're doing it to control the flow of air and water through the soil. So that's what, so they're making something that kind of, in my mind, it's kind of like millions and millions of tiny little cups and saucers stacked up there in the soil or that soil reef that I talked about before. So good soil, that has a really thriving um, community of soil microorganisms has that honeycomb, that coral reef structure, and it's knitted together by carbon in, from that glue. So that's how the carbon gets in the soil to begin with. I used to think 
before I was doing the research for this book that sort of the carbonaceous stuff that's in the soil was pieces of rotted plants and stuff like that. Um, you know, when I would dig in my garden um, previously, and I don't really dig much anymore, but I used to dig in my garden and, you know, try to stick a lot of chopped up leaves and stuff like that down there because I thought that was how you got um, good stuff into the soil. But, but really those dead bits of plants are the least parts of it. It's the carbon that's in the bodies of the microorganisms and in their waste and in, in, in the glue. And this stuff is dark, you know, the more it gets concentrated in the soil, it's dark. And I, so it, it finally, um, it started to really amuse me, you know, in the spring, um, you go to the garden supply store and you buy these, you know, bags of humus and bags of stuff, you know, to put on your garden and it's all dyed black. And I thought, you know, we instinctively know that it's, it's supposed to be dark out there. We instinctively know that it's good if it's dark. So I guess, you know, the people making that stuff say, they instinctively know that, so let's put some dye in there. So the thing is, so that's how over millions and millions of years, that's how the soil built up this, this, this really intense amount of, of carbon. But everything that we humans have done since we started agriculture um, has released that, has, has dissipated that carbon. You know, we started to burn down forests and plow up the land. So when we rake open the land like that, um, we're exposing that carbon to oxide and it just, it volatilizes. And we domesticated wild animals and changed the way they move over the soil. So that also, it, 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 it um, you know, they eat down when they're not moving the way that they used to, um, moving so that they're, they're kind of always moving and always bunching because they're afraid of predators, but we remove the predators and put up fences and stuff like that. Um, they will just eat the, eat the grass down and kill it. Um, so when we started doing all that stuff, um, we really started to change things. And uh, one scientist, Rutan Lal, has estimated that 80 billion tons of carbon have been lost from the world's soils by, by human activity. And, you know, we always think of ancient humans as like, oh, they were so much better than we are, you know. They loved the land, they respected the land. Well, you know, there were just fewer of them. Um, they, did things, they did things that were also very damaging to the land and they just had a longer period of time in which to do it. But there's another scientist who has estimated that ancient humans warmed the climate so much by what they were doing on the land that we averted an ice age uh, 2,000 years ago, that they warmed the climate that much. So all that carbon that's in the air from years of agriculture and now from the industrial age um, is called the legacy load. And it's, it's not going to go away, not right away, it's not gonna go away even if we stop doing all the things that we usually tell ourselves that we're so terrible that we keep doing, you know. It's not gonna go away if we stop driving cars tomorrow, it's not gonna go away if we stopped burning coal, it's not gonna, it's just not going to. Um, it would break down in a couple of thousand years, but we don't have that much time. So Rattan Lal, the scientist that I was talking about before, a couple of decades ago, he got the idea that we might be able to change the way that we use the land to build up that store of carbon in the soil again. So that we not, and do our, not only our ag agriculture, but all our land management. Do it so that we're not only increasing the problem, but that we're reversing the problem. So he's been going around the world for the last couple of decades talking about that idea. So it was really great meeting him, great talking to him, but the, really the most, um, you know, I, I traveled and talked to a lot of people where I, when I was working on the book, but for me, like, ground zero of, of the soil health movement is Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, I met this farmer there, and the reason I met him was that I was at a conference, um, I was at a conference about agriculture and carbon and I met a young guy who was working for the National Wildlife Federation. Well, the National Wildlife Federation had declared that climate change was the greatest threat that there is currently to, to wildlife. So they sent this young guy, his name is Elliot Vuitton, um, around the country to visit farms and see who was practicing agriculture in a way that it was not contributing to the problem and maybe trying to reverse the problem. And he told me 
that Gabe Brown in Bismarck, North Dakota was just like the most awesome farmer in the country. So I went out there to meet him. So the thing that I really love about Gabe Brown's example is that he didn't get into agriculture. Um, so let me just back up a second. I, I was, I was talking, I'm doing an article about organic seed production. So I was talking to somebody in connection with that and she said, she was talking about this young group, um, this group of young people who are growing organic seed and she said, oh, it's just so great. They, they just work so hard and they just don't care if they get paid. It's just great. And I thought, you know, that's, that's just terrible because it's not going to last long if they don't get paid. Um, the thing about, that's great about Gabe Brown is that he got into agriculture because he wanted to make a good living. I mean, he, he also got into agriculture for the reasons that other people do. You know, they love the land, they, they love farming, but, you know, he wanted to make a good living and he went to ag school and he, you know, got a degree and he went back to this farm that he um, bought at great expense from his father-in-law and he um, started farming, doing all the things that they had taught him in ag school. Um, he started to change things a little bit because he's a really, he's just a really smart and observant guy. So he noticed things about his lands. He started to change some things. He noticed that um, that his land was drier than he thought it should be, and he thought that tilling contributed to that dryness. And so he stopped tilling. He went no till. And he also um, he also started experimenting with cover crops um, with two or three cover crops, which you probably know, a lot of you probably know what that is, but just in case you don't, um, cover crops are something that you plant on the, the land between a market crop just to protect the soil. So farmers have done that off and on, some, for thousands of years. Um, I think it's only recently that, that somebody like Gabe Brown understands that it's not that the cover crop is just protecting the soil from wind erosion and water erosion, it's also feeding that underground community of microorganisms. But, you know, it's a good thing to do. So he started doing that too. And he was doing okay. And then he had this like epic fight with nature. For four years in a row, there was some weather anomaly that wiped out his crops. Four years in a row. So there was frost one year, and there was drought one year, and there was hail one year, and there was probably drought another year, four years in which he had nothing to take to market. And so he had no money. He was just worried about hanging onto the land, and he had no money. He had no money to invest in all those chemicals that he had been taught in ag school that he was going to put in there. And um, so, you know, he did what he could. He didn't, um, instead of buying a lot of hay for his, his cattle, he was sending them into these ruined fields to clean up the stalks and the, the ruined crops. Um, and he did start to notice that he, that his soil was healthier. His land seemed more resilient than his neighbors. And he started to wonder, and, and around this time he started working with a, a soil scientist who was working with the USDA, and she's now the science director at the Rodale Institute. Um, but he started w working with her, um, talking about what was going on in his land, and she was saying, well, hey, you know, when you see that, I think that might be what's going on. You know, there was this kind of really great fertile partnership between the two of them. And he started wondering if he could do all the things that he used to do, get all the same effects, you know, that his plants could be in a fertile, you know, his plants could be fertilized, his insect problems could be handled, that he could do all these things just by mimicking what went on in nature. Because if you look at what's going on in nature, um, you know, it doesn't need fertilizer and pesticides and herbicides. It, it seems to manage. Um, so he started doing some things that, that he noticed was going on in nature. So one of the things that's, that's very clear in nature is that um, the monocrops, which are the mainstay of industrial agriculture, just, you know, there are no monocrops in nature. Um, in a square foot of prairie near Gabe Brown's farm there, you know, he had a, a botanist come in and look, and there were 140 different plant species in that one square foot, which is just amazing. Um, and so he, he started really paying attention to having the ground cover. So nature is dense, you know. Humans disrupt land and cause bare land, but nature, for the most part, you know, it's, it, it wants a pelt 
a, a thick pelt of vegetation on the soil. And it wants a diverse pelt of vegetation on the soil. I was One of the, the scientists that I um, interviewed for my book was explaining that, you know, really diseases and pests, those are nature's attempt to disrupt a monocrop, disrupt a monoculture and restore diversity. Um, so Gabe Brown started really trying to mimic nature by having um, not only cover crops, he, he, he does this thing where he gets a new piece of land and to get the soil the way he wants it, he, he grows these uh, cover crops on it that are cover crop cocktails. So there are maybe 30 varieties of plants growing there in that area for a season or maybe even a year or two. Um, and then when they, you know, they're finished growing, he takes his cattle in there and the cattle eat it and stomp it down and all that. And that's how he gets his land in good shape. Um, so he started doing all this stuff, you know, the cover cropping, the really diverse cover cropping, the animal impact. He continued to have his animals go through and clean up after every crop. Um, and at this point, so like 15 years later, at this point he uses no fertilizer, no commercial fertilizer, no, no fertilizer, period. I mean, he relies on that ancient partnership between plants and soil microorganisms where the plants are sending out the carbon fuel, the microorganisms are bringing the mineral nutrients, that's his fertilizer. He uses no fungicide, he uses no pesticides, and his, his land is just so amazing. He uses no pesticides, so there's a, there are all these scientists that are there trying to figure out, like, why is he so successful? What's going on here? Like, he has no problem with the corn borer worm, which is something that American farmers spend billions of dollars every year combating. He doesn't have it. And the, the, what the entomologist that's out there studying what's going on and studying these relationships um, among the insect community, what he, they've decided is going on is that he, his cover crops, these, these, these really diverse cover crops that are everywhere on his land, are attracting this huge community of insects. And that huge community of insects is attracted, you know, includes predators and pests, and the predators are eating the pests. So that's what's going on there. Um, he uses a little bit of herbicide still every two to three years, but it's something he's always trying to figure out how to get rid of completely. Um, and he's extremely successful. So he has a higher crop yield than the county average, but he makes more money per bushel than anybody else around there because he's not spending the money on the chemicals um, and, or as much gas. And he's gotten smaller. You know, there's this thing that farmers have been told forever, you have to get bigger or else you'll go under. He's been deliberately getting smaller because he really wants to be able to manage his land in a way that the soil, the soil stays healthy. Um, and, uh, oh, what was I just going to say? Oh, yeah, he, he, he's got this great thing where he talks about, you know, he's got a herd of cattle. But when he talks about his herd, I never knew what he was talking about because he also referred to the herd of microorganisms underground as a herd. And he always says that that's the herd he's really, that's the one he's really thinking about. You know, he wants the herd of, of cattle to be in good shape, but they won't be unless that herd of microorganisms underground is, is really healthy. Um, his land also, and I think this is really so important now that people everywhere are so worried about drought and weather anomalies. It, you know, if it doesn't, you know, if the rains are not coming as steadily as they used to, and then they come all of a sudden and you get all the rain in three days that you would have gotten in three months, you know, that's really a problem. And you want your land to be able to soak up that rain. You don't want the the, the, the rain to be landing on land that does not have that coral reef structure that I was talking about. That kind of land, the water will just run off. Most of it will just run off and you'll be dry again in a couple of days. His land, um, when he first started working on it, um, it had a percolation rate of a half an inch an hour. It now has a percolation rate of eight inches of water an hour. So he just says, I don't worry about grout. Um, so I think the, re the, you know, the reason I'm really excited about the stuff that he's been doing is that he's an example of somebody who's thriving and healing the land. And we're always given this false dichotomy about, well, you know, 
you can have your organic farms and your cute little farmers who used to be philosophy majors and you know those are really nice and I'm sure it's really good food but we have nine billion people that we have to feed you know we're given this false dichotomy and it's really um, you know there are people who are showing that we can have great production great food and healthy land um, so I'm, I'm just gonna end I, I haven't even been looking to see if I've been talking too long I'm just gonna end with a quote from Peter Donovan and I'm not sure if any of you people know Peter Donovan did he come through here so Peter Donovan is this guy who um, He's, he, with some other people, started this thing called the Soil Carbon Challenge. And he lives in a yellow school bus, and he travels around the country, and he goes from farming community to farming community to visit people who have um, signed up for the Soil Carbon Challenge. And he, what he does is he goes to their land, and he measures the soil carbon there in, in one area. And then he comes back in three years or five years or then ten years, um, and he sees how the amount of carbon in the soil has grown because of the management practices of whoever has that farm. And then, you know, at the end of the 10 years, or that's, I think it's probably gonna take longer than that, but at the end of the 10 years, then whoever grew the amount of carbon in their, the soil the most gets the prize. But anyway, he's just an amazing guy. I mean, there are just so many amazing people in the soil health movement. So I called him sort of towards the end of working on the book, and I said that I was just, so blown away that everybody in the soil health movement was so optimistic, whereas everybody else I knew, when it came to talking about the environment and climate, was just so depressed. And, um, and I asked him why. Why did he think everybody was so optimistic? And he, so this is what he said. He said they were optimistic because they're connected with the most powerful geological force, geologic force, which is life. Most of what we take to be the physical environment is the creation of living organisms over time. That's a different paradigm than the idea that life is a fragile passenger on a dead planet. So I just love that, that we are not fragile passengers on a dead planet. We're, we have powerful allies in the soil and we're understanding more about what they do and how, how we affect their work all the time. And I think we can all play a role in helping them. You know, we can, play a role by the food that we eat, that we buy, that we eat, the, the food system that we support. We can uh, play a role in uh, the kind of choices we tell our government to make, and that's a lot harder. Um, and we can play a role just in terms of the land that we have under our own control. 80% of homeowners have a yard. You know, we can make our, or have a lawn, rather. So we can make those, um, surprisingly enough, lawns can be really good ecosystems if they are handled right. You know, if, they, if again, we have that dense, diverse um, plant community going on there. Um, so, you know, and it's not that it's a slam dunk, of course. We've, been, we've had the system of agriculture that we have now for 50, 60, 70 years. Um, and there are very, very powerful interests, of course, behind it, and who stand to lose a lot of money if we tell them to get lost. But, um, but uh, you know, we consumers have a lot of power, and we're already starting to change that food system. So let's keep doing that. So that, I, I don't have anything more to say. You can ask me questions. Yeah. Well, there's equipment called no-till, and it, what it does is that it makes, instead of like make, digging down and making a great big furrow, it makes a tiny, it kind of makes tiny little slits in the soil, which pokes in the seeds and it covers it over. So it disrupts the land. I mean, it's still, it is still a disruption, but it's not quite the disruption that those um, big tillers are. Right. 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 So Gabe has Gabe has his animals go through the fields and eat down. Not he doesn't have them eat it all because he wants a lot of it there for the soil microorganisms to eat, and they do. Um, so yeah, he never he never turns that old crop into this. He never he hasn't plowed in twenty years. So. 
he's just seeding that, that new crop into the remains of the old crop. And he's also, pardon me? Right. Right. So whatever the cash crop is, and it becomes over the top of it, the cover crop, and then the grain becomes over it, it will be a cash crop. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Did you say something about biochar? Oh, I didn't address biochar. I don't really understand it very well. well I don't either. That's why I asked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, nobody. Um, I guess I didn't follow up on, the, there were a couple of people who said, yeah, you should have biochar in there. Um, nobody ever was able to really convince me that it, that it belonged in this book, so. What is, <laughs> what is biochar? Is it like microorganism No, it is, somebody out here could probably answer this better than I can. It's, it's, it's plant material that has been burned under certain conditions that is supposed to make soil more fertile. It's locking up carbon through the charcoal process in the states and in the soil for centuries as opposed to, you know, decades. Yeah, and see, I just never found that very, I guess I was really focusing on the, the microorganisms and the plants. So I never got into the biochar. Okay. Yeah. Um, mentioned his name several times, but I haven't caught it. Tom, the, the man that influenced you, the scientist that influenced you. Ratan Wall. Ratan, R A T T A N L A L. He's at the Ohio State University Carbon Sequestration Something Something Center. And the other man up in. in uh, Gabe Coast Collins? Gabe? Uh, Abe Collins, sorry. Abe Collins. Yeah. I know. <laughs> but there was also a Gabe Brown. Gabe Brown is the farmer in um, North Dakota that. Yeah. Uh, thank you for all the soil science and the reasonable hope. Um, I, I was wondering if you could say something. You mentioned all the bacteria down below. Right, I'm sure that that's true. I'm sure that that's true. So, um, but again, thank you. And I really enjoyed hearing you on uh, Science Friday. It was great. Uh, it was just on Friday. I know. You showed up here. Wow. Thank you so much. I still haven't listened to that. I still have not been brave enough to listen to that. <laughs> 40 minutes. No, it's 20 minutes. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I knew it was going to be 20 minutes, and I'm, you know, with the headsets on and this huge, huge microphone. Um, no, M NPR. Um, and, you know, then he starts to talk, and then it's happening, and I took a deep breath, and really, 20 minutes, it was just like, I, I, did I exhale? I don't know. <laughs> it was over really quickly. Yeah, so he was on the air. I'm going to be talking on, there's a, uh, not that you can listen to this, but there's a, Iowa uh, Public Radio has a show that I'm going to be talking on with another farmer from Iowa who does this. The 26th, I think. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Um, well, again, where you buy your food. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit of a food nut purist, you know. I just, I really only buy stuff from the farmer's market or from 
um, some of the urban farms in Portland. Um, I want to, you know, I always expected somebody to, to say to me, oh, you picky food people, you know, first you want us to buy organic, and then you want us to buy local, and then sustainable, and now we have to worry about the soil, and nobody ever asked me that. <laughs> but, you know, I think that the, 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 the small farmers who are really doing a good job with their crops and their animals, they're also taking care of the soil. They know that they have to take care of the soil. So, um, I mean, that's, that's one thing, is that we have to pay a lot more attention to the food that we eat and the, the, the food system that we subsidize through our food dollars. And that is changing the food system. It is already changing the food system. Um, I think that we really have to pay, pay attention to what our government does um, in terms of what form of agriculture it supports. And that, of course, is like a huge complicated ball of wax that I barely understand. I, I pay attention to groups like Food and Water Watch and the Union of Concerned Scientists and some other groups. They really pay a lot of attention to those issues. So I do what they tell me to do. Um, I know that um, one of the, so one of the things that I wrote about in the book, I mean, to me, you know, when I think about the book and what I think about the really exciting stuff in the book is, is partnerships. You know, there's partnerships in nature that we have to honor and respect and support. But there are really exciting partnerships going on among people. You know, partnerships between farmers and scientists. Um, and what was I just going to say? <laughs> um, I know, I know, but what partnership was I thinking of? Oh, okay, so one partnership is um, up in Portland, there's a young guy who works for um, the USDA, and he is working with farmers and environmental groups to set up programs that give incentives to farmers to transition from hurtful practices to helpful ones. And um, God, what is my, my brain? Oh, OK. So he, he's got a couple of these things going. and. Um, there's a little bit of a cash incentive that goes to these farmers to change, a little bit of a cash incentive that goes to them every year to make the change. Because they have to, to, to transition over to a really healthy situation with the soil. It takes about three, if you've been doing this agriculture that disrupts that partnership between plants and soil microorganisms, it takes about three years for that community of microorganisms to bounce back. So. This program supports those farmers as they make a transition. And so this guy was telling me about these programs that he's working on doing this. And this is money that comes from the farm bill. So not a lot of money that, you know, you know that most of the money going in the farm bill goes to support industrial agriculture. But this is money in the farm bill that's going to this stuff. And, um, and he was telling me that, um, he was telling me that the, the, sci the, the, the farmers who agreed to do these programs and to get this money, they had to agree not only to change the, the practices of them themselves, but they had to agree that that land would follow that regimen forever. They had to encumber their ancestors, their, ch not their, their children. They had to encumber every, they had, yes, they had to, they, and, and you would think that that would be a total deal breaker. I mean, how can somebody say, I am going to swear that this land for the next X number of generations is going to be no-till or this can, and um, they had so much demand. They had, they had like 10 times as much demand as he had dollars for. So I think that we really want, and that's the reason I was talking about this to begin with, that's an example of our government doing something good with our tax dollars, and we really want to push them to do more of that kind of thing. And then I think the third thing is just to, you know, to take care of the land that we have, um, that we have some control over, our own yards, our own parks. I mean, the parks, um, urban areas can be managed organically. People are doing it at, at, at Harvard. People are doing it at the Battery City Park System, whatever that's called. Um, so there are people who are, who are managing these public areas that get so much, you know, people tromping on them and uh, playing football on them. They're managing those lands without these chemicals that we're told we need. We don't need them. Yeah. I hope this isn't off-putting, and I don't know if you know or anybody else knows. Is the, has the, have you dealt at all with um, woodland burials? 
No. Because I think this would be another way that we could really make pockets of intellectual richness. Huh. With what kind of burials? Woodwork. Oh, okay. I think it's a great idea, but no, I haven't dealt with it. Yeah. 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 I mean, I always tell my kids, I just want them to drop me in the woods and walk away. You know, you bring up a good point. Um, again, that, that idea of partnerships. Every major environmental organization, and probably a lot of the ones I've never even heard of, are working within agriculture now to, to help um, working lands be healthy lands. So I think that's a super exciting development. And the Xerxes Society is publishing a book um, this month uh, to support uh, farmland using native uh, pollinators right. instead of, uh, and the book is just like a step-by-step -step how to uh, stop using pesticides and herbicides and start using your native pollinators. Yeah, they're doing some great work. I did an article for Modern Farming, Modern Farmer, a couple of months ago about the loss of native, po native pollinators. So honeybees, you know, we talk a lot about Clive, uh, hive collapse and all that, but native, uh, but um, honeybees are actually a, an imported mm -hmm. alien species. We have, I think, 4,000 species of native bees in the United States, which are killed, which, which are dying because, um, mostly because of farmers round up, uh, spring round up on their habitat. But, um, and, but the, the, the farmers that are understanding that they need those wild, those native wildflowers, which attract those attract and support those native pollinators, they're finding that their fields are so much more productive that even if they lose acreage right. to, they to the wildflowers, yields. they get higher yields. Yeah. Here in Boulder County, we have 550 species of bees and 23 species of bumblebees that do a better job of pollinating than honeybees. And once you have them, they are your bees because they don't go very far from <laughs> where they live. It's great. Yeah. The guy from the Xerxes Society told me if it was kind of like Tinkerbell saying, if every person clapped, if every person planted one wildflower in their yard, they would save the native bees. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. You. Well, the carbon sugars leak out yeah. as the as the plant is alive, and you know when the plant dies, it's not photosynthesizing anymore. So those, you know, the the roots themselves are carbonaceous material that stays in the earth. The soil microorganisms are going to eat that too. Yeah, but I thought it was just not really a matter of eating, but more a matter of when it dies, the roots 
stays there and they slowly add sugar to the dessert mm -hmm. or when the yeast grows it needs a little bit because it needs to uh, lubricate the soil to get, to get through it. So I, I don't even know what it means. I think the most important function that's going on there in terms of getting carbon in the soil is that leaking, is the, the, the carbon sugars that's feeding the soil microorganisms. Because it's not only putting carbon in the soil, it's building up that community of soil microorganisms that's doing so much else to keep the plants, that plant kingdom healthy. Yeah. And root diet. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Could you guys talk a little bit more about that process? Because that seems like that's kind of the new, was the new thing for me when I was born. So could you talk a little bit more about, you know, when does it happen? You know, how does it happen? Um, Um, well, it happens when the plants are growing. I don't, I don't know how to, I'm not sure what more. Is that with all plants? Does it happen like it's yeah. sometimes you can do more to? You know, I think that there are probably some differences among plants, but I don't know what those are. I know that there are researchers. Um, I know that there are some researchers, um, plant breeders, who are looking at different, um, different way at, at the at plants that might genetically be better at working with that community of plant micro, uh, of soil microorganisms, but I don't know what those differences are yet, and, I, and I'm not sure that anybody does yet. Yeah, I was talking to one of the soil scientists whose work I discuss in the book. Um, and we were talking about that same thing. I said, well, is it the same microorganisms that are in the soil, that are on the leaves of the plants, that are in us? And he said, we think they're 90% the same. So that's kind of crazy. <laughs> I have not uh, opened up a capsule and looked at them. Good idea. That's my take on it. Sure. Sounds right to me. All right, well, I think I've hit my time limit. But thank you for all for coming. Yeah. Great talking with you.